Good evening, everyone uh, who are joining us from India. Uh, good morning to the ones who are joining us from the Western part of the world. I'm your host, Mashoud Bhatt. And we would like to welcome you to this very special session of Detox uh, or Disruptive uh, Education and Literacy as um, we continue to bring uh, speakers, thought leaders, change makers, movers and shakers from across <laughs> the world who have been working uh, in the field of education and especially uh, have uh, created a seismic shift in uh, literacy in their own communities. Uh, and today we would like to showcase the example of uh, a very uh, visionary organization, an organization which has been doing amazing work in the United States, uh, Literacy Chicago. It is the biggest literacy organization in the city of Chicago uh, and has uh, really uh, focused its initiatives on people who uh, often have to struggle uh, with literacy uh, and has been focusing a lot uh, with respect to adult literacy, um, English as a second language, workforce development, uh, citizenship classes, as well as numerous other bridge programs uh, for people, uh, most of whom English, for whom English is not the first language. Uh, so uh, we are very honored to uh, to have uh, a representative from Literacy Chicago. She is the director of program development uh, at Literacy Chicago. Um, she was, uh, she in fact has a very uh, interesting and uh, quite a unique uh, personal <laughs> journey, uh, has traveled the world. She was born in Chicago, but has been an adventurer, uh, traversing, you know, across the globe from France, Pakistan, Egypt, Qatar. Uh, she knows many languages, including French and Arabic, uh, and has uh, worked uh, in very different and diverse fields, including education, uh, communications like radio and TV, and even brain training. And, and that's something which is very exciting to uh, learn more about. Um, and uh, presently, she is uh, leading the program development at Literacy Chicago, and also leads the volunteer tutor program, which has uh, a phenomenal team of nearly 150 uh, enthusiastic volunteers. So we're proud to welcome Ms. Joanne Telser Frere. Uh, Joanne, it's uh, truly an honor to have you here. We're very excited to learn more uh, from your presentation about Literacy Chicago and the phenomenal work which you guys are doing there. It's my honor to be part of the detox. And I'm, I'm so grateful for you to ha have reached out to me to so that I can talk about Literacy Chicago. I've been working with this organization for the last six years and it's, it's changed my life. And I, I hope I've helped change some other people's lives. So here I'm in, in near Chicago. So good morning to those who are waking up and good evening to, to my new friends in India. Uh, I have some slides to show you. So we can, can you hit the present button please over there? Perfect, thank you so much. So wonderful, I have a, a wonderful technician on the other side of the world, isn't that amazing? So Literacy Chicago is the oldest literacy organization in the city of Chicago. We were born about 54 years ago. And we, slide please. And so this is, uh, my work here has become my passion. I'm, as Mashud said, I'm the director of program development and it, in a nonprofit world, that means you wear a lot of hats. So one of the things that I do, and you can see all the pictures that I'm showing you are pictures of our students or our classes. And so over on the left, you'll see I, some volunteers who have just completed their training. We do 15 hours of volunteer training. And the other picture is, you can see me with a group of our students where we were doing a pilot that I'll tell you about more tomorrow. Uh, slide. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the some just give you some overall facts and figures about literacy in the United States and then in Chicago and then talk about what we do. And tomorrow you can hit the slide, please. We will talk more about our approach to adult literacy and some of the 
the problems that people have or have had in the past preventing them from learning to read. Slide. So just close your eyes for a second, or you can leave them open. Actually, leave them open so you can see my great pictures that I'm going to show you in a second. But it's so hard for people who are literate to imagine life without words. So just think for a second, what if you went into the store and you couldn't read, for example, a can, a can of tomato sauce? If you had diabetes or if you had problems with any health problems and you had to avoid certain things, you would not be able to pick it up and read what, what you have, what's in the can. Or what if you go to the doctor? Uh, we all know doctors around the world, and I've seen many of them, don't know how to write clearly anyway. But if you couldn't read, you wouldn't be able to understand what he wrote down. You walk out in the street, look around you, you wouldn't be able to read the signs in the street. you wouldn't be able to sit down and read your Sunday newspaper or any newspaper for that matter, uh, or read a map or do basic math. Math and reading are very much connected, especially basic math. Uh, you wouldn't be able to read directions on how to assemble your new furniture. And I I know that new furniture comes with very complicated directions, not always written in your language and sometimes kind of bizarre translations. You couldn't write a love note or read a love note. You wouldn't be able to read your grandmother's recipe that she left you and that you wanted to create. You wouldn't be able to read a book to your kids to make them want to read. And you would really have trouble participating in civic engagement, like voting or other things. Just when you think about it for a few minutes, it, it's so scary not to be able to read what is going on around you. So for those of us who can read, it's kind of like when you go to a foreign country and the signs are not in your language. So you really don't bother even looking at them. I know that if I'm in a country like China or Japan, and I don't know if we have any Chinese or Japanese people here, but I can't read your language. And English now is such a worldwide language that there might be a few words in English that pop up here and there, and I will see those. They will pop out at me, and I'll, I will read them. And we call those words sight words, words that you see and you understand. And to people who are literate, I would say 98% of all words are sight words in their own language. And then you might have trouble with a few technical words or medical words or words that are, are not common. But you would just read everything. You don't even think about it. And people who can't read don't even notice the words because they already know they can't read them. So it's kind of hard to get into the headset of somebody who can't read. And for me, it's heartbreaking. So in the United States, there are many, many people who are illiterate, which is very scary. And I'm not, we're going to do a little experiment here and see if you can put in a number in the chat box of how many people you think might be illiterate in, in this country. Let's see, I'll see if anything comes in there. And I want to thank you all for being here. I, this with me this morning. Okay. Mashud is checking some comments. I don't see any popping up on my screen. So I'll just go ahead and tell you. Pro-literacy, which is the biggest literacy organization in the United States, um, has this number. Let's show it, Mashud. 
Oh, we have, oh, we have one person that said a million. Well, you know, it's a lot more. I don't know if we have any other people. Oh, okay. 50%. Well, that's, you know, that's kind of getting close for some people. Okay, let's show them what pro-literacy says, Mashud. Mashud uh, is doing the slides for me, so, you know, excuse us if uh, there's a slight delay. Mashud estimates 43 million adults cannot read, write, or do basic, basic math above third grade level. So third grade level here in the United States is, I think, about 10 years old. And it, that is such a scary number because maybe some of you have 10 year olds or you've known 10 year olds and they can kind of get by. So adults can kind of get by. They know a lot of the basic stuff, but just think how much they're missing. And even scarier, uh, the US Department of Education did a recent study where they found 130 million people below sixth grade level. So that's over half of the, the people who live in this country. Now, just to give you an idea, sixth grade level is still a pretty good level because you can read a newspaper at that level. So these are people who can function extremely well, they can read newspapers, they know what's going on around them. But still, I find that number scary and heartbreaking. So illiteracy, as you probably know, is very much connected to health, poverty, and crime. And there, Barbara Bush, the uh, who was the wife of George Bush, recently did in, to, in September 2020, so it's pretty recent, a poll uh, with an organization called Gallup that you may have heard of. It's a huge organization. And they find that the cost of low literacy is $2.2 trillion in the United States. And in addition, uh, the United States is each state in the United States is divided into what we call counties. And the counties in the United States with the lowest literacy rates have the worst health, the most poverty, and the least amount of economic mobility. In addition, if you look at the prison in the United States, 75% of incarcerated people have low literacy levels. So we could really see a correlation between not being able to read and crime. And however, they did discover that for those who participate in correctional educational programs within the, the jails and the prisons, are 43% less likely to go back out and do crimes again. So this connection is, is really very strong. Let's look at Illinois for a minute. This is where I live. And I have a map just to put it in your heads where exactly where Illinois is situated. We are in the Midwest. And if you see that arrow, it's pointing right to Chicago, or pretty close. And you can see we're right on the tip of Lake Michigan. Chicago uh, is the third largest city in the United States. Whoops, uh oh, I just lost you. Mashud, can you hear me? Uh, uh, yes, Joanne, uh, we can hear you. Okay, I can't see the screen anymore for some reason. Let me see what happened. Oh, okay. I guess I hit a button. Uh, so let's look at the next slide. It, so in the state of Illinois, you can see, as this is part of the study that the Barbara Bush Foundation did, and there are 20 point 4% of adults in Chicago have low literacy. And uh, you can see here that, that the relationship between low literacy and 
equity and the quality of life is very, very strong. Uh, Chicago itself, now we can look at Chicago in the next slide. And the population today in Chicago is 2.7 million approximately. And out of that 2.7 million, there are 882,000 people who are functionally illiterate. So functionally illiterate means they're probably at about second, third grade level. They, they can read a little bit. So we're not talking about people who are completely illiterate. They can walk down the street and some signs will pop out at them, but they can't do all of the other things that I was talking about earlier. And I looked up the the level of people living below the poverty line in Chicago and discovered that the numbers are extremely close. So once again, that that reinforces this idea that poverty and illiteracy are very strongly connected. Um, our mission as an organization is to empower people to be more self-sufficient through language, through literary, literacy instruction. And that handsome man over there in that picture is our executive director, uh, Rich Dominguez. Let me tell you a little bit about the programs that Mashud mentioned. So as I said, we are 54 years old and we have a variety of different programs that we offer. So English as a second language is one of them, GED, citizenship preparation, adult literacy, digital literacy, which we started working on a couple of years ago, workforce skills, and then we have individual tutors for all of our students. What makes Literacy Chicago different from other places, I think, in our city is our executive director. Uh, he is passionate about our mission, and he grew up, he is the son of Mexican parents who didn't know how to read. So it's very close to his heart as well. Uh, for me, my son, who finally learned how to read, had a lot of trouble getting there. And it was it was heartbreaking to see him struggle. But finally, he did manage to grow up and learn how to read. So I'll tell you a little bit about all of our programs and who we serve. Uh, this is, a, oh, can you go back a sec uh, to the ESL slide? Yeah, thank you. No, the other way. <laughs> so in Chicago, we have a huge population of immigrants. About 30% are Latinos, and so that's about one, um, Oh, I'm terrible in math, but the uh, total population is 1.8 million of immigrants. And so we, we work with them. We also work with the public schools in Chicago that has students that speak over 100 different languages. And recently we started a very exciting program. In fact, it was about six months before COVID hit we had started going into the schools. So the parents would come, drop off their kids for school, and then stay for an English lesson. And that was wonderful because we were in their neighborhood. And that's what we're trying to do is to go to people where they are and serve them in their communities. So we have these two kind of populations. One are immigrants, and then the other population in our students are researchers, business people, expats who live here and who want to work on their English skills. So they're very different. This second group of people is often very uh, a group of very highly educated people. They may speak several languages. They may be able to read English, but they can't speak it. Whereas in our immigrant population, often they live in areas where they speak their own language. There are areas in Chicago where 
you could grow up never speaking a word of English and you would be fine. Okay, let's go now to our GED program. So GED means uh, General Equivalency Diploma. And what it is, is for people who have dropped out of high school, uh, anyone, normally in the United States, you finish high school at about 17. And if you don't finish, then you don't have a high school diploma. And in fact, that stops you right there from doing a lot of different jobs. So we give training for, to them and we teach them everything they missed in high school and then they can go on and pass their exam. Uh, slide. I don't know if you know, but becoming a citizen in the United States is a very long and difficult process. First of all, you have to have lived in the United States for five years with a green card. And then you have to do an application, which is 22 pages long. And it's filled with questions that you have to answer. Now, these questions uh, you, you wrote a year before you're actually called into your interview. So you have well, let's say eight months to a year to look at uh, everything, to memorize the questions on your form. Plus, you have to take a history test, a writing test, and a reading test. Uh, the history is in several parts because you have the regular history, you have the cultural history, and then you have to know about all kinds of holidays. You have to know about your rights. You have to know how the government is put together. There are 100 questions and at your interview, they will only ask you 10, but you don't know which 10 until you actually get there. So basically we teach our students all the 100 questions. So basically they're taking a, a journey from when the first People came to the United States up till today. They're learning all of the history, the culture, the government, and we prepare them. And we're so proud because every single student that has gone through our class and then has gone through this scary interview have become citizens. So yes, very proud of that. Uh, next slide, please. So this, Adult literacy is my particular passion. I am in charge of the adult literacy program at uh, uh, Literacy Chicago. Here you can see our typical classroom. These are students in a very informal setting because it makes them feel more adult. We don't put them in rows. They sit around table and they learn together. And I'll tell you more about them tomorrow, especially the, the man up in the corner who couldn't read at all when he joined us and now likes to take a book, go down by the lake and read on a Sunday afternoon. About four years ago, I guess in 2018, my first big project at Literacy Chicago was to help bridge the internet gap. And again, something that most of us start taking for granted. Uh, although I have to admit, I learned on a typewriter and I was telling somebody the other day that was one of the best things I learned in school was how to type. Little did I know then that we would be typing everything all the time not only, not only writing college papers, but communicating across the world, even on chats and, and everything. But the world of the internet has become such an important part of our daily lives. And I think the last year during this COVID pandemic has strengthened this even more because that's the way we've had to communicate in the United States countless people stayed at home to work and including me and th thank goodness that I could see people every day right in my desk just like I can 
see you and and continue my work. So we started a program and at the time that was my, my project, put together an adult literacy program for people who can't read. <laughs> and I can tell you that was a really interesting challenge because four years ago, there wasn't very much out there that had already been done for, in terms of, of computer skills for people who couldn't read. And I put together a program with very using super easy vocabulary and lots of pictures. And we've, we piloted it that year and the students liked it and they did start to lose their fear of technology and lose their fear of what is a computer and is it going to break if I hit the wrong key? Because that was a big step for people. And then COVID came along and I can tell you that I'm so thankful for our volunteers because we had to move all of our courses online. And some of our volunteers, we have volunteers who are older and had already retired and had never had to use computers in their work. So for them too, it was a huge learning curve, but everybody stepped in and did their part and we trained the students. But when you're on the phone with someone, trying to tell them how to download an app on their computer, or you're trying to explain to them which keys to press, to turn on your computer and to get in. And, and they say, oh, there's words I don't know. And for example, download, one of our students said, you know, okay, what's this word? They had to spell it to us on the phone for us to understand what they were seeing on their screen. and since they couldn't read, they had a lot of trouble interpreting what they saw on their screens to us so that we could help them on the, on the phone. Well, the first teacher and all of our adult literacy teachers and digital literacy teachers and citizenship teachers are volunteers. The first one to actually get in, create a class and open it up was an older guy who it told me, I, I never done this before, but I'll try. And that's the attitude of our volunteers. Uh, go on. So another thing that we've been doing in Chicago that I find it very exciting is reaching out to the community and partnering with different organizations that have similar philosophies and missions to ours. And as I mentioned before, what we're trying to do is to get out into the community where people are so we can go to them instead of having them always come to us. Our adult literacy students sometimes travel an hour, an hour and a half every day just to come to our classes. So these are four of the different organizations that we've been working with. The one over on the left is called uh, Revolution Workshop. This is an organization on the west side of Chicago and uh, that started, I'm actually I'm not sure how many years ago, we've been working with them for three or four years already. And they teach carpentry skills. So these programs are free. And in fact, they, they sometimes get a small stipend and it's for people men and women 18 to 40 who want to learn carpentry. So carpentry in, in the States, especially if you're a union member, is a highly wanted, needed skill and it pays pretty well. So we've been working with them in teaching uh, math, but um, math for carpentry as opposed to all the other things. So you can imagine, in addition to basic mathematics, they need geometry and, and some other notions in order to cut angles and, and build. We've also helped some of their uh, recruits who can't read. 
and others who never got their high school degree, because if you have your high school degree, then you can join the union and then you can have a higher salary. So some of the students come to us in the evenings to get their GEDs. And if any of you have been to Chicago, uh, the CTA is the Chicago Transportation Authority. Um, it was also the name of the band Chicago at first and they had to drop it because I don't know. But the CTA has uh, trains and buses that go all over the city of Chicago. Uh, you can actually get around here very well without a car. And they have a special program that they call the Second Chance Program. So these are for people who, for one reason or another, couldn't get a rather a job easily. They may have been incarcerated. Uh, they may have had learning disabilities. They may have had uh, drug or alcohol problems. And this program is to give them a second chance. And they get trained to work on the trains at the very lowest level uh, to start with, you know, mostly maintenance, cleaning, and things like that. But they also have the chance <clears throat> to get a regular job in the CTA once they've gone through this program and grow from there. So we intervene with them on digital literacy because most of them have never used a computer and uh, they need it, they need it. You need to be able to send emails at the very minimum when you're in a work situation. The, uh, the uh, other uh, pictures over on the right of the, the people cooking is a cooking school, which is not too far from us actually, and not too far from Revolution Workshop in the West Loop. And this Inspiration Kitchens is called is uh, a school that trains people to work in restaurants. So they learn everything from basic cooking um, to washing the dishes to serving people. And they have a little restaurant in their headquarters where you can go and actually you can order a meal, you can eat there. And so the students cook and they serve and they take orders and it's a wonderful program. And we've also been doing digital literacy with them. Uh, on the bottom, you'll see some sh more chefs. We seem to gravitate so towards the hospitality uh, in, in fields. And this on the bottom is a very new program in Chicago called Unite Here. It's the Chicago Hospitality Institute. They're brand new. They just got started this summer and they're based on a, um, they're copied kind of and working with a huge in similar institute in Los Angeles, which has been going for years. Uh, you can see the students in their classes and this is Chef David and uh, Literacy Chicago is extremely excited about partnering with them because they uh, they're on the very high end of cooking and they place their students in the best hotels, the best restaurants in Chicago. And they're also at the beginning of their program. That This is the second cohort that we have already worked with. So there's a lot of room for cooperation and growth. And what we've done with them so far is helping them with number one, literacy, for example, they had a, an amazing chef who was in his 40s. He came over years ago from Haiti. He got a job. He went up in the field. He became a fabulous cook. He can't read a recipe. So we worked with him and studied. We gave him individual tutoring in addition to regular classes. And we're, we're so proud that he passed his exam. And now he's totally qualified and he, he was able to pick up reading amazingly quickly because he's working so hard at it. And even though his program at UCHI has finished, he has continued to studying with his tutor. And it's it's really beautiful. They have kind of a love affair. I mean, in, in, in a mental sense of the way because they love working together. He adores working with her, learning to read. 
Um, she's a foodie. So of course, talking about food is a lot of fun for her. And also the, the pure joy in, in seeing somebody succeed. And so we've been doing reading and English as a second language with them. And we're looking forward to a lot of different innovative programs with this um, institute. Let's move on. I'd just like to tell you a little bit about our tutoring program. We have volunteers aged 16. I only have three who are 16 who are in high school who want to start helping up to about a woman in her 80s who's been volunteering for us for over 15 years and still working with the same students. So we have actually two parts to our program, the English as a Second Language and the GD programs all have professional certified teachers that are paid for their work. And then we have the volunteer program and we teach, as I mentioned, citizenship, adult literacy, and, um, and we tutor anybody in the program. So it could be someone in English, a second language program, a workforce skills program, a GD program, or adult literacy, citizenship. We, we're open to tutoring one-on-one -on -one everyone. And um, in this picture, you can see two different pairs of tutors. Um, in, in the bigger picture, the, the man on the left is from Bangladesh. And he, he's, uh, he's like a son to me. And he has done so much for us. His name's Sanji. And he's an amazing young man who has also helped us with a lot of other projects. And on the right is Crystal, who I'll tell you a little bit about her story tomorrow. And up in the, in the corner is a, uh, an American woman, Diane, and her student, Araceli, who is Mexican and who got through the citizenship program, improved her English and is now an American citizen. So we're, we're so proud of them. And our students love our, our, our teachers, our volunteer teachers, because they come and they give, they give and they give. But what is so beautiful is that all of our volunteers receive so much from their students. They receive the joy of seeing people improve. They see the joy of their students when they get it. That, that that light in the eyes that just goes on. And it's, it's a very beautiful thing. And we have uh, amazing volunteers. I'll tell you a little bit more about them tomorrow and some of the projects I've been working on with them because it's all connected to adult literacy. So I think we're coming up to the end of my presentation, but I, I need to to brag a little bit and show you oh, just one minute uh, on the next slide in one sec. Uh, we're gonna look at a little video. For the, the last year, uh, uh, let me explain first before you hit it. Uh, we've been uh, recording authors all over the world and they then we put together little programs once a month. Hey, can you go back? Uh, a slide, yeah, and it's called Voices of Literacy. It is a, so the time will be Wednesday, six o'clock Chicago Standard Time. So I, I think that's probably like the middle of the night for most people in India. But if you would like to come, uh, I, I would be thrilled to invite anyone on this call. I will send you a free Zoom link. Uh, we just charge a pittance anyway. It's more of a fundraiser. But these are the six authors will be uh, who will be reading. Well, actually, three are authors and three are other people. So I we have a very short little teaser that now we can show to you. So what does literacy mean to me? Literacy to me means possibilities. 
literacy means opening up new worlds and be, be, being able to go places you just couldn't go otherwise. What literacy means to me, it's a, it's a means of communication. Um, uh, in what we're about to show you now, it's like uh, we work in drama and uh, the way that as a writer you communicate with the actor is by writing and it's also a great way to communicate with an audience. I think literacy to me is synonymous with opportunity. It's a way to connect to your community and to the world. Literacy uh, to me means empowerment. It means that an individual is pursuing their path to excellence, to engagement, to the ability to act. Literacy for me is power and access. You have power to um, visit worlds and people and lifestyles that you may not have uh, come across uh, in your uh, waking world. But when you have literacy, you can add information and have power and access to great thoughts, ideas, and information. So as I said, if you would like to come, uh, you can write to me. I've put my, um, uh, we have time for questions, I think, in the next slide. And then the very last slide, I have put up my uh, email address, and you can also find all this information on our website. And if you write on the website to info at literacychicago.org, I'm the one who reads that. And anyone who would like to join us Wednesday night, our Wednesday night, your middle of the night, or depending where you are, I would be so excited to send you the Zoom link because that is truly a fun event and we have prizes and we give away books and a lot of times the authors come and we have some discussion with them. So I'd like to thank everybody for being here and listening uh, this morning, my morning. <laughs> uh, thank, thank you, Joanne, so much. Truly, it's been uh, 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 a refreshing cup of tea for us as well here to <laughs> To listen in at our evening and uh, you know such a phenomenal journey uh, of literacy Chicago uh, how you know how, how you're working with uh, people who are uh, often at odds and then you know help, helping them to kind of uh, really uh, you know transform their lives uh, truly uh, not not just you know the uh, ability to read but really to uh, uh, to be uh, more actively participating in their life uh, you know like to uh, because so so many people uh, there is this uh, thing called the american dream uh, and you are helping them realize it so it's it's truly uh, phenomenal uh, and wonderful that the work which you uh, and your team are leading um uh, I, I had some questions when i was listening to your presentation uh, and uh, you know like uh, there, there might be some of these questions which you might be answering in more detail in tomorrow's uh, I'll presentation take notes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. So uh, I think the, the very first uh, point uh, in your presentation, which, which is really stark, and especially for uh, us here who are not living in the United States, uh, just the magnitude of uh, illiteracy, the magnitude of the number of people um, who are not functionally literate. Uh, is uh, is huge and 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 that's something which comes as very surprising uh and uh, this comes surprising also because uh, when we see you know for example countries like india were more uh, they universalized their education primary school education more recently very recently whereas the western countries are known to have kind of uh, advocated uh, uh, you know universal education sorry so what what is your assessment of you know, why Why this problem exists uh, in the first place? That's a difficult one. Um, because I, I think this problem is so vast. And it has to do, unfortunately, with the racial divide in our country, has to do with poverty. So it's like a cycle, right? If you're, if you're born into, uh, if you're born poor, and you're in a neighborhood that the schools aren't very good, then it's much easier. Well, let me tell you this, what one of our students told me who, 
and maybe this is, it's not maybe the universal answer, but what happens is, for example, we had uh, a student, a black uh, African-American student, and unfortunately there's a large group size proportion, let's say, of African-Americans who don't get the, the schooling they need. And so this guy who's doing fine now, great guy, fun person. Uh, when I met him, he was in our program and, and doing very well. And he told me his story one day and he, you know, he said he grew up in a very poor section of Chicago where there are lots of gangs and lots of fighting. And he was in a school, he didn't like it so much. He, maybe a lot of people have some reading issues or, or learning disabilities that are not detected at a young age. And so they're just kind of pushed along in the school. And so he looked around in his neighborhood and he saw guys making money really easily. Uh, selling drugs, getting involved in, in crime. And it was easier than going to school, much easier. So he actually became um, a gang leader. He was one of the big leaders of the gangs. He told me his story. He had, you know, expensive cars, beautiful apartments, women, girls, money, you know, the whole thing. But he couldn't read. He couldn't read. And he got caught. He got sent to jail, and that's where it hit him that he couldn't read because he couldn't communicate with his family. He was shut, completely shut off from the outside world. He couldn't write letters. He couldn't read letters. And something clicked at that moment in his, in his head, and he came to us, and he decided he was going to change his life, and he did. And he started his own business and you know he if actually he spoke at one of our galas because um, you know he had changed so much but this man was a leader right but he got into the wrong area of leadership now he's he's able to have his own company run his own life and so i think it's stories like that there's so many different stories, and I can tell you a few of the stories tomorrow of some of our students, but a lot of times it just has to do with overcrowded schools, not detecting learning disabilities, growing up in, in a neighborhood where, where it's dangerous to go to school. So that's probably not really the answer to your question, but it's what I have seen. Right. That's that's a very uh, interesting remark and uh, truly like some, some of the stories that you have uh, shared are so inspiring uh, of people who have completely, you know, with, with your team's help, completely uh, uh, turned around their lives. Uh, and uh, it's it's also important because we, we see, um, you know, if when we talk about adult literacy, uh, I mean, and again, kind of sharing the context here from India, we, we see kind of much more interest in. Uh, at the very topmost level of government, more on uh, children's literacy and education uh, and less on adult literacy. How how, uh, how, how is the situation uh, in the context of the United States about Chicago? How, how, do you, uh, how does the organization manage to, uh, for example, get the required financial support as well to, to, uh, to run this very important program? So it's exactly the same here. And I often talk about adults as the forgotten population because it's so important for adults to learn to read that because they are going to inspire their kids to learn to read. Uh, one of our volunteers, when asked, what was your favorite book? She answered, it's the first book my parents read to me. I don't know what it was, but it made me want to read. And so, you know, the kids, everybody focuses on the kids. And there's a lot of money in many organizations that go to helping kids read. And it's very important. I, But a lot of times we forget about the adults who, for one reason or another, never got there. And so we are funded by the state of Illinois. We have two grants. And the rest is donations, um, smaller grants 
grants. So yeah, if anybody out there wants to donate to Literacy Chicago, we would be thrilled. Uh, we have a small permanent staff and we have a lot of volunteers. Uh, like, uh, like you said, I have over 150 volunteers and every month I train new people. So that's how we do it. But it, it's, yeah, if I can put a call out for donations on our website, there's a donation button on every page. <laughs> and we're thrilled to, because in our grants, there's no line, for example, for marketing. There's no line for, you know, paying for advertisements. There's no line for helping our students buy a bus ticket. I had one student that couldn't come to class because he couldn't afford to buy transportation. And you know, we can't we can't start giving to one person and then and not others. So we don't have those funds to do that. But um, we're doing well with what we have. And I, I just wanted to say before it's time to to leave that I'm just so thrilled to have met you, Mashoud and Melicia and Sunita and all and your organization. <clears throat> and I'm very excited about your program, which focuses on people who can't read anything. And uh, we, we will be doing a project together. And that's I'm, I'm very excited about that. I'm going to be doing a project using your materials uh, to, to see how it helps people who have a little bit of knowledge already. I think it's going to just make them... Zoom up. Uh, so Global Dreams has an amazing program that I'm I'm so thrilled about that you guys have been working out in within the slums a lot with children and adults, and so I just wanted to thank you for reaching out to me and Melissa for finding me, and I feel like this is a new adventure in international cooperation. Absolutely, Joan. Uh, we, are, we, we are truly excited as well. Uh, and definitely, we, we'll be kind of hearing more from you in tomorrow's session. But before we before we let you go uh, for uh, for uh, from today's session, uh, I think uh, one one point uh, which again which was very exciting was uh, volunteers um, who are helping in the the tutoring and. Uh, you know, really supporting uh, the work of literacy in uh, in the centers. Uh, but we also have workplace attachments, right? Like where literacy is being kind of delivered at the uh, different workplaces in partnership with. Uh, so here, here, can you share a bit more about how exactly? Uh, like, is it like the volunteers going to the to the workplaces, or do you train uh, members of that particular partner organization to deliver literacy? If you could, like uh, conclude on that note, please. I, I suggest I tell you more about volunteer program tomorrow because it's it's very exciting. Uh, to answer your question, uh, we our volunteers come to us, uh, and they're they're not with the usually not with the organization. It has happened that once in a while, somebody in an organization <clears throat> that we're working with says, "Oh, I love what you're doing. Can I join?" But most of the time, people come. I, I've been reaching out to the universe <clears throat> for Literacy Chicago and, uh, <coughs> excuse me, I <coughs> swallowed my coffee the wrong way. I've been reaching out and the, the universe has been listening to me and sending people. Um, I truly believe that the, somehow they, they hear my words, people hear my words that I said, we need some help and they come. And I have met the most amazing people. I, I, like I said, I have a few people who are in high school, three students who have been volunteering for a couple of years. And they started when they were 14, already 16. I feel like that that's pretty exciting to have kids you know, helping adults. And I have uh, one volunteer who has been with us 15 years working with, with the same students because what it, it, the, a bond 
is made between the volunteers and the students. And I'll tell you more about that tomorrow because it, I could go on for another hour just about how amazing the volunteers are. I've made friends um, <clears throat> with some of the volunteers, people I would never meet, but the people who come to us have, they come because they want to give. They want to give, but you can't be do something for years and years that you're just giving unless you're receiving something back. And what they get back is, is immense pleasure that they never thought they would get when they started. The pleasure of, of volunteering, the pleasure of helping someone. And right. it's pretty exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And, and uh, uh, I must say that we're really excited uh, to, uh, to see the second part of this talk tomorrow. Uh, where you'll be um, kind of uh, demystifying or delving more into the curricular and uh, pedagogical aspects mm -hmm. of our literacy uh, and how Literacy Chicago, what has been the learnings, because this is uh, also something which uh, we see a lot of uh, conversation and uh, debate on. And uh, it, it's something which really, uh, you know, we, we'll really benefit from your uh, experiences and that of Literacy Chicago into what really works in the curricular pedagogical aspects. Um, so, uh, Joanne, uh, it's it's been uh, truly refreshing and truly wonderful to learn about uh, the wonderful work which you and your team are leading uh, at Chicago. And we're uh, really looking forward uh, for tomorrow's session um, where we'll see you at the same time here. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time uh, and for your ideas. The pleasure is all mine. Thank you, Mashu. Okay. Thank you.